everyone, thanks for being with us today. You could have been outside in the sunshine at a park or a beach, and instead you've chosen to be here with us inside having this conversation. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your commitment to this conversation. We appreciate your presence with us very much. My name is Laura Albert, and I direct, I steward and um, organize the free programming at Indian Summer Festival under the guidance of Siraj Rao, our co-founder and artistic director. And this event is called A Tale of Two Markets. This event is part of our seventh annual Indian Summer Festival, and it is co-presented by SFU Woodward's cultural programs and uh, alongside our presenting partner, SFU City Programs. Let's give a little round of applause for their support for this program. <laughs> We're four days into our festival, and we have a number of both ticketed and free events coming up in this building in the city across the Lower Mainland. So please pick up a program and check out to see if there's another event that would strike your fancy and of course tell your friends. We'd very much love to see your face again. This conversation today is about how to bridge conversations through and across communities in the face of neo-imperialism and the crushing trend and pressure toward monoculture. And so this is a complicated conversation to have. Uh, myself being a European settler is particularly complicated for me to be holding the mic in this moment. I do so under uh, the encouragement of my colleagues. Uh, and of course it's complicated also for racialized settlers to be in solidarity with indigenous organizing that's happening in these lands. So of course we stand here today in the shared Coast Salish territories of the Musqueam people, of the Squamish people, of the tsleil people, and these people have been, since time immemorial, the stewards of these lands and of these waters. And they continue today to be at the front of resistance of neo-imperialism, making sure that this is a safe place not only for us to live, but also for plants and animals. And so any and all organizing that we do has to be in solidarity with indigenous territories on these lands. It's an important aspect to bring into this conversation, despite the fact that today we're actually talking about gentrification between two particular communities. In this instance, the gentrification of Chinatown and of Punjabi market. So today we're going to speak for a time and then we'll have some Q&A time and we do have a microphone that will be passed around the room for the Q&A. Please use it, sometimes it feels like your voice is loud but it can be hard for someone across the room to hear you so we are providing a microphone for that reason. Join the conversation if you'd like to, we're using the hashtag today, two markets why we are with photographs, you can keep that hashtag alive as you move through these neighborhoods and we also use the hashtag where worlds meet at Indian Summer Festival. I'm very proud and very honored to do this mic check uh, in advance of amplifying the work of these brilliant organizers and panelists that we have today. And I will now pass the mic over to my colleague and my dear friend, Sandy Manch. Thanks, Laura. My name is Sandy. I'm the communications manager with the festival. To all of us at Indian Summer, the festival is really a model for the kind of society we like to see. A society that is creative, diverse, inclusive, and innovative. Our mission is to offer a model for dialogue, and thus a possibility for an inclusive community that is unafraid of striking up conversations both cheerful and difficult. One of the people who epitomizes this ability to navigate these types of conversations with grace is Andy Yang, the Director of City Program at SFU. Andy will be moderating today's discussion. Please join me in welcoming him to the stage. <laughs> moderating an event over here at uh, SFU and uh, it's an honor that it happened over this wonderful festival and I'd like to thank so much the uh, the fine folks here at the Indian Summer Festival to host this event here. Um, by percentage of population at 40%, Vancouver is the most Asian metro metropolitan area in North America with South Asian and Chinese origins being the largest uh, in number, Vancouver's Chinatown and Punjabi markets sit at a twilight zone, in an urban twilight. The question is whether they're at a sunset or a sunrise. For 135 years, in, case, in the case of Chinatown, and half a century in the case of the Punjabi market, these two neighborhoods have, more than, have been just more than places where commerce happens. They have been the heart of their communities, nurturing businesses, human relationships, artists, food systems, and cultural legacies. Today, they stand at the brink of tremendous urban change and pressures. 
how can we imagine their futures? To explore this question, we assembled a, ver a very diverse panel versed in these communities from the perspectives of the arts, community research, and development, and the media. So I, I'll, I guess I'll just announce each, each, uh, each person, each panelist here with their um, respective uh, biographies. Um, the first person I'd like to introduce you to is Panit Singh. Panit is the theater instructor at the Arts Umbrella, as well as playwright and filmmaker who focuses on stories rooted in Sikh and South Asian history. Panit? The second person. Oh, I think Panita. We switched it. Oh, you switched it? Okay. It's all, it's all about change. It's, it's all about change. Change. the dynamic elements of the community. Um, the, the second person, at least on my list, here is Tyler Russell. Tyler Russell is the executive director, curator of Center A, Vancouver, the Vancouver Inn Center for Contemporary Asian Art, an art gallery that moved into Chinatown in 2013. Tyler's tenure began in January 2014, just as the most recent wave of Chinatown condominium developments were just about to get in the full swing. Tyler. <laughs> The second, per <clears throat> the the third person on our panel is Melissa Fong. Yes, Melissa Fong is a doctoral research fellow at the University of Toronto in planning and geography. She's investigating re the re re revitalization planning in Vancouver's Chinatown with the support of a social research humanities and re re research council fellowship. Melissa. <laughs> And finally, uh, our fourth panelist tonight is today is Mira Baines. Mira is a TV radio online journalist with CBC News in Vancouver. She has been a journalist for more than 11 years reporting locally and on a national level. She started out with CBC reporting in Surrey where she covered issues involving the South Asian community. Over the years, she's covered the Punjabi markets in Vancouver and Surrey and their evolution. Yeah. So the setup of this panel really covers the past, present, and future of each other's mark uh, of, of of these marketplaces and these spaces. Um, I, I I I I kept my question short, really, as a kind of uh, uh, as, as really a set of kind of provocative questions for folks to kind of talk about on the panel, as well as to kind of ultimately reach out to you folks in the audience to enter this conversation, as I think uh, part of it is engaging the questions you might have. So I think if we will start, we will begin. So the first question, it's a question, and this is a question first to Mira and Benit, question from the past. What are your memories of Chinatown? Please. <laughs> okay, well, for me, I grew up in Kamloops, BC. Uh, a lot of CBC journalists, we come from far-flung parts, and then we end up in the big city. So for me, coming to Vancouver, we were always coming for uh, an Indian wedding of some sort. And we'd make it as far as the Punjabi Market and Queen Elizabeth Park for the post-wedding photos, and then that was it. So Chinatown for me, my Chinatown experience came much later in life. I, after going to school for many years, I ended up working at a television station. And it was, a, I, I think a, a lot of you might remember it as Channel M, and then it became Omni. And so basically, this television station specialized in newscasts uh, in language. So there were Cantonese, Mandarin, Pegog, uh, Punjabi newscasts. So I worked as a researcher, producer, and so that building for Channel M was actually located on West Pender. And so that was my first experience. And then, then I was there every, you know, for every week, five days a, five days a week uh, in Chinatown for the next three years. So I was actually really surprised that it was so big because our Punjabi market was actually only, it's only a few blocks. And many of you saw it today. 
But Chinatown itself, I was surprised at how big it was, and there were so many businesses, and they were there for so many years. Because our Punjabi market is fairly, fairly new in terms of history. Uh, you know, it, it started establishing itself back in uh, 1970 after the, the Roth Street Temple was built and designed by uh, Arthur Erickson. And so a lot of the Punjabis started moving out there. They were actually, the community was actually first settled in a First Avenue area in Burrard, and then moved out there. But, but for Chinatown itself, every day we would go there and I discovered a lot of restaurants, a lot of places where I could buy these little things that I, I, I didn't even know existed. So for me, that was my experience. Uh, yeah, there, it's interesting. Um, I've been thinking about this for a couple of days. Um, my relationship to Chinatown and where it kind of started. Um, because it, it, it's one of those places that it does hold a special place in my heart as well. Um, just as the Punjabi market does. And I thought back, and you thought back, and we were talking about this on the tour as well. Um, there's a book I read as a kid, um, White Jade Tiger, right? And it takes place, and from what I remembered again, um, was Chinatown. So all I remember was Chinatown. And then, so I was thinking about this, and like how, you know, that book was kind of cool for me, and like, and then when I Googled it, it was Chinatown in Victoria. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay, uh, wrong Chinatown. But, um, <laughs> Um, but it did kind of, you know, the, there's this, the, in my imagination, it, it did make this kind of place kind of cool, right? And the, well, one thing I have to credit um, in my educators for is that we, I, Chinatown was an active part of my learning experience um, in school. I mean, I, I had the privilege of having fantastic teachers. Um, and I think I visited Chinatown between the, between the, grade, the kindergarten and grade 10. I probably visited there about eight times. Right, um, which is really cool. The Chinese New Year, um, once Dr. Sun Yat Sen Garden, and then a couple other times too. Um, so maybe well, four times. So, um, but I've been there quite a lot, and um, especially then. So, having been exposed to the space, having been there a few times, um, and then learning about uh, Chinese railroad workers, um, and then that kind of history as it's happening at the same time um, as uh, things like Hong and Maru and. Um, other areas of interest I already had, um, it really kind of uh, solidified that place that Chinatown had in my heart. Um, a few, and then again, as I got older, um, as research became more intense and learning about um, uh, the the presence of the South Asian community in Chinatown um, at Center A, um, there's that exhibition uh, curated by uh, my friend Naveen Gurn, Green Brown in Chinatown in Goonj, um, which was which was really amazing. And then learning about the intercultural story that was happening. Um, and it's, it's only become more and more important to me as time goes on. Okay, thank you. Melissa and Tyler, what are your memories and experiences of the Punjabi market? <laughs> um, I've, been, I've been thinking about this for a couple days too, and um, I, my initial response is nothing. Like, I don't have childhood memories of the Punjabi market at all. Um, because I grew up on the west side of Vancouver. And it's interesting that I actually don't have any childhood memories of Punjabi market at all because it speaks to um, a time growing up in Vancouver where the west and east side divide was so stark, right? Ontario Street being that divide. Um, and so my earliest memories of the Punjabi market are actually like in adulthood after sort of university because I also went to UBC so my my daily commute was westward it wasn't eastward ever um, and then um, my friend circle grew and then most of my friends that I still have today are all from the east side <laughs> east van um, almost none of them from West Vancouver anymore um, and so that's where my memories begin to start, so it's really interesting that I have none. But um, on the walking tour earlier, we were talking about, um, Panit was talking about um, Vancouver specials and how important it was in that neighborhood. Um, and I was like, hold on, maybe I do have a memory. Um, my parents' first house and my grandparents, um, the first house that they rented was on Main Street in a, in a, um, a Vancouver special, and I had recalled just going going there every weekend um, and as we might know in the room, Vancouver specials are really important to migrant communities in Vancouver. Um, they maximize like 
the, the lot and the volume. They have different um, parts of uh, the house where you can cut up so that you can have um, multiple families, extended families, living in a single house. And I think that's important to, you know, both our cultures that you have extended families within one household, right? And so, maybe I do, maybe I do. Um, well, I, I come to both uh, Chinatown and uh, the Punjabi market as, as quite an outsider, um, which may be obvious. Um, <laughs> what? Uh, <laughs> Say what? Uh, but my, my memories of, of Vancouver, let alone uh, the Punjabi market, are, you know, start very, very late in life. You know, as a child, Vancouver was the place where you caught the ferry to go to the island, or it was the, uh, the place where maybe you, you, you caught an airplane to go somewhere. Because um, I grew up in Kelowna, you know, similar to Mira, growing up in Kamloops. And uh, so it's, it's uh, quite a bit, and Expo 86, of course, I came for that. So that's like the entirety of my Vancouver memory as a child. Um, and then it's only in my like 30s, I'm dating myself a bit there, when I finally have an encounter much with Vancouver at all, let alone the, uh, the Punjabi market. Um, and I think it was in 2008, 2009, um, my sister-in-law uh, is a South Asian woman um, in Kelowna. And uh, her and my brother uh, were coming to Vancouver and uh, she's like, we have to go to the Punjabi market. And, and we get to the Punjabi market, she's like, oh my god, oh my god, are we going to go to Himalaya restaurant? Are we going to go to All India? Where, where are we going to go? And she was like having this um, the really this excited, big yeah, big debate. And so we decided that we would go to All India for, um, for lunch, and then we would get a bunch of sweets from Himalaya restaurant after, which was kind of like this, this, uh, this, this compromise. And, and uh, you know, after being introduced to the Punjabi market in that way, um, the uh, you know we tried out a couple of the restaurants and um, uh, started going to um, the original Tandoori uh, Kitchen um, in my uh, first uh, several years in uh, in, in Vancouver. Um, and and then later on, you know, um, my son started to go to preschool at the Sunset Community Center. Uh, it was a fantastic preschool there, and. Um, one of the reasons why we went there was because of how wonderfully multicultural um, it, it it was, and in South Vancouver, you know, it, it doesn't feel like you're 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 in an exclusive zone of any sort of community, and that was important to uh, my wife and I for the experience for our son. And uh, while my son was at preschool, sometimes I would go up to Roots Cafe, um, and on the corner of Main and Forty Nine. Uh, and it had just started up back in those days, and it was um, the Roots Cafe was was quite a place because you know this dedicated um, young South Asian couple who were like you know we we saw that you know things were kind of declining in, in the neighborhood, and we wanted to invest our time to like bring some energy to uh, to the neighborhood, and I think they were quite a, quite a force, and so it was really great to have conversations with them, and so that that and then. But yeah, that's that's the main chunk of my memory for yeah um, the Punjabi market. Great thing. Yeah. I, I should mention the Roots Cafe is known for its butter chicken poutine. So <laughs> over the years, you you see some of these restaurants go towards the, the fusion end. And so I did a segment for CBC Radio, and it was about the Punjabi market and how. You know, some of the businesses were moving out, but yet you were having a, a few new businesses pop up, and that was one of them, the Roots Cafe, and I went there, and she said, what would you like? And, you know, of course I want cha or chai, you know. Uh, and then she said, oh, would you like to try our butter chicken poutine? I'm like, what? <laughs> and so I actually mentioned it on, uh, on air, and then later on in the afternoon, they actually, CBC had her come down and make the butter chicken poutine <laughs> and give it to one of the hosts. So, like, it was a hit. It, it won an award, I think, if I remember correctly, a few years ago, the butter chicken poutine. Also comes with, I don't work for them, I'm not going to But you can also get a vegetarian. <laughs> a little bit of community economic development at Sanitation University. So, a question for the entire panel here is that 
in a year of Canada 150 plus or Canada 12,000, depending on how you measure that, what does a place like the Punjabi market and Chinatown fit in this type of year? <laughs> I think uh, I can start. Um, so I, I wrote an article a couple years ago, maybe a couple years ago, I don't remember, um, uh, about how Chinatown is actually the most Canadian neighborhood in, in uh, Vancouver. And I, I used that rhetorical framing to sort of recognize that Chinatown, that Canada doesn't exist east to west or west to east without Chinese migration, right? Without railroad workers. And it doesn't exist without an area where um, people of color were ghettoized. It doesn't, this are the prosperity that we enjoy today, um, well, some of us enjoy today, I would say, um, doesn't exist without um, the struggles of our communities, right? And so um, in sort of, Canada 150 and even going beyond that history of a nation state, you know, to remember these struggles and to understand that these struggles still continue. Um, and these are not irrelevant neighborhoods. They aren't a neighborhood in the past. They're still incredibly relevant today. All right, I'll jump on that. Um, uh, I, I, I agree, but I think, you know, Canada 150, um, as probably many in the room also feel, is a rather uh, inappropriate, perhaps even rude way um, to cause us to think about our histories. Um, it's effective, you know, I think we've had tons of conversations about um, Canadian history um, in, uh, you know, because of, because of the Canada 150 um, coming forward. And a huge part of the, those histories is to go, wait, are we a diverse um, country? Are we a diverse community? How does that manifest itself? What are these places that are manifesting that within our built environments? Like in, in Vancouver, you know, where we have uh, Chinatown and Punjabi Market and things like that, that, um, that remind us of our diversity as we drive down and walk through the streets. Um, and, and, and I think that it's really important that we reflect on, on those spaces and, and, and how it is that we construct, because like, you know, a nation state is something that is constructed, it's constructed over time, much like a city is constructed over time. And so to become self-conscious of that, um, those acts of construction um, and, and to, to see how they are materially manifest um, in, in, in space and in experience, um, and, and so, yeah, I think that in, in those ways, like the um, Pajemi Market and Chinatown are particularly um, important to our reflection at this time when we're um, uh, sort of, yeah, rudely shaken to consider history. No, oh, and, and that's true. And, you know, I just listening to Tyler, I just started becoming really, really angry. Uh, because, <laughs> because when you do go down to the Punjabi market, um, you don't see the murals, you don't see anything commemorating that history really, you just see the signs on the corners and that's really it. And you do see the empty storefronts and, and so at this time, you know, Canada 150, you go to the market and, and where is the history, what's being commemorated and who hasn't stepped in to do it. So. In one way, you can look at the lack, like what's missing here, what needs to be done, right? And, and so I think that's when we look into the future, what you can kind of see, well, you can, how are we going to attract people to this area? How are we going to revitalize it if we don't have anything that people can, can sort of remember the, the, the history of that area? Yeah, I think, I mean, so much of... Canada 150, let's pretend like that's a thing for a second. Um, so much of it is about a sense of place, I think, right? I mean, um, we're talking about the displacement of indigenous communities, we're talking about um, people feeling like, or like, I guess, founding people, exploiting people's emotions to make them feel like they're part of like this nation state, right? To make them feel patriotic and Canadian. Um, and we're talking about 
um, well, those two things and like kind of how they're combating and how you navigate those two things. And but if you pretend like Canada 150 is a thing, and and I think we all acknowledge, no matter where we fall on the spectrum of how we feel about celebrating 150 years of confederation or recognizing it, is that we can all we can all accept that the, having a sense of place is important, right? I mean, that's why this dialogue even exists, is because a sense of place is important. So um, having acknowledged that and understood that, I think it kind of speaks for itself where Punjabi market and Chinatown falls into that narrative, right? Because um, how many times, I've heard it from uh, a million people, it's, uh, who cares about the Punjabi market if you can go to a health business center in Surrey where there's 150 stores in one complex and you can, like, it's not a problem, right? Or why, why does Chinatown matter when you can get whatever you want somewhere else, right? Um, but it's, it's not just about commerce, it's about a sense of place. Um, so I think in this, in this conversation around Canada 150 plus, uh, I, think, I think it's not at the center, I think the center is definitely about the indigenous community, but it's definitely right there. Um, you know, it's, it's a point of contention and I think it's definitely something that needs to be talked about. Thank you. It actually leads into our second question for the panel. At a time when South Asian and Chinese populations are now living throughout the region, and where Indian and Chinese goods and services can be found in many places, like a TNT supermarket or food, food can? Food can. Food can. Food can. That, the, that, that really, where does a place like the Punjabi market and Chinatown fit? Does Vancouver really need them? As we see in both these tours, there's been considerable development in, in, in these two places. And really, what the, where does these places now fit into Vancouver's present? Okay. Um, uh, the, um, you know, I think the, the question could be asked maybe in two ways. One is, do the communities need the Chinatown or the Punjabi market? And does Vancouver need Chinatown and Punjabi market? And um, what, who needs it more? What, how is it needed? Um, and, you know, I, I, was, I was in LA um, recently, and I visited the Chinatown there, um, and it was very much a distinct um, place. Um, and in terms of its architecture and how it's experienced as a as a walked sort of landscape, um, but perhaps one of the most um, poignant things that I I I, uh, I learned through my uh, experience in LA was I, I visited the Museum of Contemporary Art, um, uh, the Geffen, and there was a there was a, an exhibition by uh, American minimalist Carl Andre, and Carl Andre had a um, uh, you know, he, he had an installation which was essentially 137 bricks um, sort of out on a, uh, uh, extending from a wall. And he, they, they, their wall text was something that I, I just want to read a little bit um, from for you because I think it, it really speaks to this, um, uh, to, this, to this question. It says, in the 1960s, Andre rejected the traditional sculptural principles of verticality and autonomy in space. One of his important works from 1966, Lever, consists of a straight, up, a straight strip of 137 fire bricks jutting out from the wall. Andre described the work as a path cut and a, a path cut and fallen column. He said, a place is an area within an environment which has been altered in such a way as to make the general environment more conspicuous. Adding, place is the finite domain of one or more cuts into space. And, you know, I reflected on that and thought, it is so important for Vancouver to have places like Chinatown and the Punjabi market, um, in that in order to make the general environment more conspicuous, you need to have places within that space. And how, how much architecture impacts that sense of place. 
and you know how that how that then then, then affects the, the the general environment. Um, and I think there's a lot to be said about the need for personal memory, community, and, and those sorts of things as well. But I just thought um, that um, how that minimalist art exhibition, <laughs> which I did not expect to think about anything around uh, Chinatown or Punjabi market from, uh, really kind of brought something out. And uh, yeah, so there, there's my two bits. Yeah, I think, um, well, that was great. <laughs> but I think uh, it's, I, I like what you said, is that is it important to the community or is it important to Vancouver, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, for me, it's equally as important to both. Um, and the, the reason is because, and like I said, your, like, your commercial needs can be met elsewhere. And that's something I accept. And I think that's something we probably all feel like, you know, more or less on the same page about. Um, but what the space means and what it's acted as and what it, and what it can be for the future, what I can say has not been replicated. I can say this very confidently about the Punjabi community in the, in the Lower Mainland, is that what hasn't been, com uh, hasn't been um, emulated from the Punjabi market is this sense of shared space for a very, very diverse South Asian community, right? Um, there's so little kind of baggage, if I can use that word, attached to the, the Punjabi market, right? Anyone of South Asian descent now could come there and organize something there, and everyone of South Asian descent feels connected to it, right? It's not a place of worship, so someone doesn't feel alienated on that line. Um, while political action takes place there, it's not a place where political bodies are um, associated with, so everyone feels welcome there. So it's, I don't think that's been emulated. I don't think there's a public space like that anywhere in Syria. I don't think there's anywhere in the Lower Mainland, and I don't think there can be. Um, unless there's an active effort to make it happen, and even then it's like, uh, how do you create a history out of nothing, right? How do you create a sense of worth out of nothing, when, whereas here there's attached history of, of, again, like you said, half a century. So, I mean, and it's not even just half a century, I would say, the Punjabi market story, um, when we were doing the walking tour of Milan, um, it, it started in the bus, right? And whoever was on the walking tour could, can echo this. It started as soon as we left this building, because the Punjabi market doesn't happen without um, the Punjabi, without the South Asian community at Commercial Drive, without the South Asian community in downtown Vancouver, in Kitsilano, right? Um, the 50 years before that. So you really have kind of this natural progression that took us to the Punjabi market, and you have all the histories kind of entrenched in the streets there, entrenched in the storefronts, uh, entrenched in all that business. So um, in, in terms of what it means to preserve it to the people, um, it means a great deal, and in terms of the city, it's like whatever matters for the people should naturally matter to the city, right? Because or else, what purpose does the city serve other than to exist, um, other than for the whatever's inhabiting it? So um, I think it's they're just as important now. I mean, Chinatown as well as intercultural space and the political space um, as a social space is so, super important, and I don't think that can be found. Um, and I can't speak for the Chinese community, but I I, I know for a fact that can't be found anywhere else in the South Asian community other than the Punjabi market. I, I think there's a sense of community that can be found in Chinatown or Punjabi market that suggestion infuriates me. Mm -hmm. And what makes me more angry is that our, our local politicians suggest things like that. They say, why, why do, I'm all for Chinatown, but why do we need to save Chinatown when I can just drive to Victorian 41st? Somebody said that, like one of our local representatives said that. And, you know, we, like not all of us also have the luxury to pull up our bootstraps and get in our car and drive there first. And, but also we never in Vancouver or anywhere in, you know, a colonial nation state um, problematize too many kind of um, like statues of old white men. You know, or like we never really problematize some neighborhoods being too white. And all of a sudden when somebody says, oh, we don't need a Chinatown because all of Vancouver is a Chinatown, ha ha. Um, it, we start to get like, there, there is that popular conception in news and comments on the news sections, you know, it's terrible that um, we're problematizing too many people of color in Vancouver. And what does that say that we're not accepting of those histories um, in building this land together, right? That really put, 
says something about where we're at in reconciliation, right? Um, that the building of this nation state is, has been incredibly violent and conti continues to be. Um, and if we're going to celebrate, you know, Canada 150 and reconciliation, you know, where are the histories of non-white folks and indigenous peoples represented here? They can't just be, you know, we can't start problematizing, you know, that we don't need to have a, an additional, like, Asian place, because you already have that Asian ethno verb. That's yours, right? So uh, it's, it's really frustrating. So Richmond, Surrey, Markham, and Toronto. Can we applaud your answer? Because it was just so good. I thought it was <laughs> and also, similarly, that the Chinese community is so diverse. So anybody um, Chinese of, that is considered Chinese, even though Chinese is like so diverse, knows the difference, like we were having this conversation earlier, knows the difference between what a CDC is, what, what from someone from Hong Kong is, Taiwan, the PRC, you know, and those are actually like really strong divisions even within the Chinese community. Cantonese speakers, you know, like Mandarin speakers, it's so diverse, right? Um, so to just pile us into, you have Richmond, now go away, you know, that's really offensive. Well, I would agree. Like a, a market like the Punjabi market on Main Street, you can't you can't replicate that in Surrey. Now, a, a lot of the shops have left, and there there were major anchor stores. There was one called the Frontier Cloth House, uh, and it was it was a massive store. And if anybody was getting married, they'd go there and they'd buy their wedding linga and everything. But, but over the years, even that shop moved to Surrey. And so you had a lot of the major anchor stores leaving. And so you had these empty storefronts, less foot traffic, et cetera. And so I went to the, the head of the Punjabi Market Association and I said, well, what are you guys doing? And, and so I did a number of stories over the years. And, and this was one of the things that they said that they always uh, you know, bang their head up against. And it was dealing with the different levels of government. When one level of government would say, okay, you know what, why don't we give you some money for beautification or this and that, another, another arm of the government wouldn't play ball. Like, let's say um, there's the India Gate. Uh, back in, I think, about 2008, 2009, uh, there was, uh, yes, there was this proposal for an India Gate. Uh, it seems a bit outlandish because by then, a number of businesses had left the Punjabi market. And so it was kind of, it almost felt in a way like they were grasping at straws, but they were getting desperate to keep some of the businesses there and to attract foot traffic. And so they wanted this attraction. And so they were hoping that this India Gate would do it. So they tried to use a lot of their uh, political muscle and all that. Um, and they did manage to get some levels of government on board with it. But then in the end, it never got built. I think it was uh, right before Vision Vancouver came in. Uh, I think they ended up getting Sam Sullivan to agree to something. But then Vision came in and then the whole thing went kaput. Uh, so they had a number of ideas over the years to try to do something. And, and one of them was even beautification. Let's, let's beautify the neighborhood. But, but none of that really happened. And so that was one of the things that they were always looking for somebody to help, but nothing helped. I think recently, though, uh, Harjeet Sajjan did dedicate about five hundred thousand dollars to the the Sunset Community Center, and they're hoping that some of that will improve that area and have a lot more people get involved with the community center and the community in that area. But you know, is it is it? It's not too little, too late because once this money comes in, then maybe the Punjabi market can evolve in a different way. It'll never be the same as it was. You're never going to see that kind of immigrant entrepreneurship from the ground up, that grassroots energy that we had back then, back in the 1970s. But you might get more established Indian businesses move back in, right? You might see some people from Surrey coming back in. Apparently the rents are really high in Surrey now because of the foot traffic there. Right? Foot traffic in Surrey. Yeah, I know it's funny. It's a funny thing. Well, 
coming from a small town, now what happens is, because I have a lot of relatives from small towns too, uh, people now from the small towns, from Kelowna, Kamloops, you know, even from the states, so when they want their Punjabi clothes, they want their Punjabi goods, they don't necessarily want to drive all the way into Vancouver anymore. They have relatives in Surrey. Why? Why not just stay out there? So they stay out there and they'll go to these big malls, the Pile Business Center, and they'll buy up everything and then they'll go back home. Because that's what we used to do uh, in the Punjabi market. We used to all come down, bring a carload of stuff back to Kamloops. It was great. <laughs> now you can buy some of that same stuff from Superstore. You know, and if you want to buy the clothes, you just, you know, you go out to Pile Business Center. And I was speaking to a business owner the other day, and I said, well, you're in Vancouver now. I think you might have seen the store. It's a really nice store. It's called Ruaz. It might have been on the tour. And uh, it's, it's a really nice store. It has high-end, you know, Punjabi outfits. It's, it's, it's wonderful. And I asked the owner, I said, well, why don't you go to Surrey? And he said, you know, the rents at the Pile Business Center in Surrey are actually four times higher than what I'm paying now. <laughs> and it's because of the foot traffic. Right? So things have changed. They're sort of flipping in a way. Because he said, you know, if I went maybe five, six years ago, you know, maybe it would have been worthwhile. The rents were still lower. But now he goes, the rents are so high. So now it's flipping where now the rents are much lower in the Punjabi market you know, because there's a lack of foot traffic. Yeah. But in now in Surrey, now the rents are rising. So it's an, it's, it's an interesting flip that's happening too. I'd like to challenge you on, 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 on an assertion you made there. You said, you know, that sounds like you're making the argument for a great place for new immigrants to start a business, rather than it not being a place where new immigrants might want to start a business. And so if the Punjabi market were cared for in an appropriate way, maybe it would be an attractive place for new immigrants to make. Because, you know, some people like being closer to an ur you know, a more urban center if they're coming from different places that are perhaps maybe more, uh, more urban. Um, that, yeah, so would it, could it not be a place where... No, um, that, well, that's the thing. Um, yeah. And that's one of the things. You, they do, right mm -hmm. now, the time is right for that to happen, mm -hmm. right? So that, that's the thing, but it, you still need some of those empty storefronts, you still need some of those buildings to be rehabilitated in order for that to happen, to make it that place where people would want to come, right. right? You know, back in the day, it would be unimaginable to have a weed store in the Punjabi market, <laughs> right? And, you know, times have changed. At least sold over the front counter, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> on, 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 on to a question about the future of these markets. About, you know, we've talked about the past, we've talked about its role in ethnic entrepreneurship uh, and immigrant entrepreneurship. Um, what do you think the future holds for Chinatown and the Punjabi market? I think you'll end up seeing a very um, mixed neighborhood. You'll see the banks, uh, you'll see the Starbucks, you'll see those kinds of businesses in the area. And you will probably still see some Indian businesses. You might see some of the immigrant entrepreneurs coming back in. Or what you might end up seeing is maybe not necessarily the immigrant entrepreneur, but you might see more global businesses coming in. Like there are like big stores in India, you know, like million, there's a, there's an the Indian, uh, uh, a store that sells uh, women's clothing. It's called Millionaire. So basically, you dress like a millionaire, and so that's a, it's a popular brand there. So you know you might see something like that come in. So you might see more of a globalization. You know, on Robson Street, you have all sorts of businesses. You have Victoria's Secret. You have Forever Twenty One. So it could, you could be attracting a bigger businesses there. Not necessarily Victoria's Secret, but something like maybe Millionaire or something. But I think you will see you'll see a resurgence, but it won't be this. It won't go the same way that it was before. I think this is where um, it's a little bit different for Punjabi market in Chinatown, definitely, because Chinatown definitely has the. I mean, more so than the Punjabi market, anyway. The like the aesthetic, the architectural aesthetic, right? Like, there's things there that really make it look like Chinatown. Um, Punjabi market. I mean, it does have its like nuances and quirks. Um, we were talking about like the like the 
the housing on top of the stores and like how it kind of reflects um, Indian architecture and that kind of stuff. But it doesn't really have like that strong kind of like you know you're walking to Punjabi market beyond the street signs and banners. Um, so it does it does differ in that sense. Um, and which I think which I think especially with looking at what's around the Punjabi market with Langira and stuff like that. Um, I mean, and this is something that I've heard from even um, some of the store owners there is that they they've seen their businesses get better. Um, as the demographic of students coming in changes, right? Um, for example, at Langara, now that there are more international students coming in from India, um, businesses like Punjab Food Center and All India Suites are doing better than they were like five years ago, right? Or ten years ago, which which is really cool, right? Um, so I think it does differ. I think Punjabi market, especially now that we're seeing buildings go down, right? Um, Main and 49th um, or developments putting one up. I think it really depends on. I think it's it's really kind of at a it's at a tipping point right now where if if developers come in and this is what I have to commend um, or development on is that um, they reach out to the community right they're making sure that they're paying some kind of respect and homage and I'm not just saying that because I'm working for them but <laughs> that's how I actually am working for them but uh, I mean I'm only working for them because that's what they're doing um, so I mean if the if the developers coming in are have that kind of sensibility and the uh, business owners now if they have the uh, kind of engaged level of engagement that they've kept over i'm thinking specifically um restaurants like himalaya i'm thinking about punjab food center i'm thinking about all india um and a few others too where they're very much passionate about the Punjabi market right um they're not just there because they happen to be there they're there because they want to be there and they do well i mean they do well despite um, people insisting that they want to say that the market's dying, right? And I hate that. I have to say, I hate it when people say the market's dying. It's not dying, right? I mean, it's changing definitely, and it's at a place where it could change for the worse, and I'm, and it could also change not for the better. But I mean, it could change into something else. It can still be Punjabi market, um, but it's not going to look the same. Um, that that's for sure going to be there, and it all depends on um, who's coming in, the level of engagement they're keeping with the community. Um, and I think that's, de that's directly going to affect kind of how well those businesses do because, um, I mean, as of the year 2000, uh, 2000 like we were sh sharing today, there's 120,000 people of South Asian descent um, living in that neighborhood. And it's gone down, but there's still tens of thousands of people living there, right? Um, and if you're going to disrespect the Punjabi market and what it means to the community, um, the community at large, um, it's not going to vote well for your business. And I think that's going to, um, that's kind of the ace up our sleeve for our community. Right, and I think it's um, it's on people that are coming in, and some of them have owned properties there for generations. They will, they owned those properties before it was Punjabi market, and they've simply been leasing them to um, South Asian uh, business, uh, to South Asian entrepreneurs. But if the people aren't going to um, respect the, like the community that they're in, I don't think they're going to receive that same respect back in the community. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Tyler, Melissa, there, I heard there was a development proposal in Chinatown or something. <laughs> something happened, speaking about respect and success of developers in the neighborhood. What might you think as a kind of discussion about the future of development in Chinatown? Okay. <laughs> um, hmm. Well, I think I think the you know um, the in terms of the future, we'll either see a dramatic failure of urban planning, or that never oh, oh, my, oh, that doesn't happen. So, sorry, Mr. Cities. Um, <laughs> at City Poor Ground, Simon Fraser University. <laughs> um, or we'll we'll see something really exciting happen. You know, and and I think. Like, I don't think the developers are demons, you know? I, I think, you know, the, the developers have, have an opportunity to learn a lot, you know? When, when I first started working in, in Vancouver's Chinatown, I knew nothing about the place. And, you know, I was blind to much of it. I could walk in Chinatown, and, you know, there's this one restaurant called Goldstone that, you know, I would walked by and I didn't even recognize it existed and, and I couldn't even know that it was jam-packed every day until Melissa Fong, um, you know, introduced me and it, it's a it, it's a process of encounter and uh, you know opening yourself and understanding and learning and then engaging together in a making of place right and 
it, there's something kind of ugly that happened in Chinatown where it was like, okay, land's cheap. Let's get it. Let's build high, you know, and, and, and sell, sell as many condos as we can. And it's like, wait a second. We have an opportunity with your guys' investment in this place to really make it into something. You know, and if, and if, if the city and uh, even the province and other levels of government were able to also engage, th like a really beautiful um, uh, collaboration with community could happen. And, uh, you know, a, a place that we can really be proud of and that is distinct and that makes the general environment more conspicuous. Um, would, would would happen. I, I, yeah, so I'm not, um, uh, I'm somewhat hopeful that there is an opportunity for that learning and collaboration and and uh, and, and uh, redevelop, both in, in, in Punjabi market and, you know, and more generally throughout Vancouver. You know, it's not just these two places, and I think we really need to acknowledge the fact that we're on stolen lands and that there's a lot more place acknowledgement, uh, you know, that needs to occur within how we build it. Um, and yeah, I th and I think there's hope for that conversation to happen. Yeah. Actually, I had a quick question. Feel free. I, I was wondering because in, in the San Francisco area in the Chinatown there, there's like a protected core of Chinatown. And now the buildings there, they can't be demolished. They're protected by the city. Now I'm wondering, is that something that could work in the Chinatown here? So it already exists. Oh. Um, Pender Street is the designated historic area. And what we're seeing from Chinatown South and all the develop condo development there is it was put in place on purpose to leverage money, community amenity contributions, in order to help pay for um, heritage preservations um, in other parts of Chinatown. And so Chinatown isn't a huge space, um, but uh, they decided that Pender Street, where, the, where some of the iconic um, society buildings are, would be pure historic, historic area, and they would protect that, and they would protect the frontages, they would protect the, um, those particular um, heritage buildings, um, and then the rest of Chinatown, um, they sort of decided to do what they did. <laughs> um, and so this is um, an unfortunate error of urban planning, right? Um, that they can't see the holistic area of Chinatown for what it is um, and using kind of inappropriate urban planning tools to leverage some parts and destroy others and um, one thing that's interesting that Tyler brought up is that if you're not from um, a certain cultural background or if you're not connected to that place um, really important spaces might not be legible to you right so you might not understand that this place that looks empty, that looks kind of meaningless to you, actually has really strong sense of community of, of place and meaning to somebody else in that neighborhood. Um, and so we need the right tools, we need the right people um, to, to really be able to recognize that those spaces are important um, to the community there. And so Chinatown for me has always been symbolic and actually quite literally a sanctuary city. It, for me, it, it has always been um, the, the original sanctuary city where you could find services for vulnerable people. I mean, where it sits right beside the downtown inside. The downtown inside used to have, um, you know, flop houses for day workers now are SROs, right? And those are being converted into luxury flats now. And the, the intent actually, I don't want to get too like urban planning-y, but the intent, no, please go ahead. <laughs> the, the intent of saving SROs was to save affordable housing. But instead of protecting the people, they protected the form. So they said micro suites can exist, hoping that micro suites would always be affordable because they're small. Who else would want to live in such small dwellings? Well, now we're seeing sort of like an upclassing of those small dwellings and poor people are being displaced from those areas. So how can we 
see the original purpose of who we're trying to protect, who, who these are for, um, and how can, how can we protect those within urban planning and not miss the mark so starkly, you know, before it's all gone. All right, so one last question before we open this up to the audience. Okay, you're spice shopping over at the Punjabi Food Center. You're grabbing an apple tart at the Newtown Bakery. Justin Trudeau, I was gonna say Premier X, but most probably Premier Oregon, uh, Mayor Robertson, step into the room. What would you tell them about the Punjabi market in Chinatown and about the tools and the stories about these places? I'd say, why aren't you returning my calls? Uh, I think, I mean, just like I don't think developers are demons necessarily, I don't think politicians are either. Um, but I think I would, oh, there we go. Uh, finally. It's Justin. It's Justin. It's Justin. It's Germany. He's doing this on purpose. Every time. Okay. Um, so, I think I would say um, that if I matter to you as someone who was born here, and someone who lives here, right, as someone as who you would probably label as a Canadian, is if I matter, then so does so does the market, so does Chinatown, and to take that um, to put that on the back burner is to put me on the back burner, right, and. 250,000 South Asians living in BC or something like that is to put them on the back burner and, the, and how many Chinese living uh, in these communities. And it's not simply um, a space for us to exist, but it, it is our existence, right? And I think we've seen that, I mean, alluding back to your uh, 150 plus question or 10 to 12,000 or um, however you want to phrase it, is that we've seen, and as the South Asian community, we have seen in this city, the erasure of our history successfully done in Kitsilano, right? Um, and I've seen the effects of it with my own eyes. We've done walking tours in Kitsilano where people have yelled at us from inside their apartments um, that get off our property, this never happened, right? It's just a story they tell, right? The, the comments of CBC articles, which always, or any article, the CBC just gets a lot of coverage. <laughs> 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 But in the, in the comments of news articles, it's that this never happened. We don't know about it. Well, you don't know about it because you, you managed to make it cease to exist. And if it's happened in Kitsilano, it can happen in South Vancouver, right? It can happen in Chinatown. And we know exactly how dangerous that can be. Thank you.